Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today for Applying the Principles of Resistant Management for Effective Disease Control presented by PBI Gordon. In the left hand side of your screen you will see a resources area that will let you download handouts. If you have a question that you would like to ask today you can type that into the, the presenter box also located on the left side of your screen. Now please welcome our presenter Brian Anardi, PhD, Northeast Research Scientist for PBI Gordon Corporation. Take it away, Brian. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you all of you for joining uh, with this presentation today uh, on the principles of resistance management and how to use them uh, to enact effective disease control. Before we really delve into resistance in particular, there are gonna be a few slides I'm gonna go through just to give you some concepts with plant disease, um, the disease triangle, uh, and some other uh, subtle differences between the different fungi that are important to keep in mind when you're looking through your fungicides uh, and applying resistance management strategies uh, to get the best control of diseases that you possibly can. So the first and most important concept uh, as we discuss resistance management is really what is plant disease, right? Plant disease is the visual result of a dynamic sustained interaction between a susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and these are mediated by conducive environmental conditions. So if you don't have a conducive environment, you're not gonna have disease. Likewise, if you don't have a susceptible host, you're not gonna have disease. These three components make up what we call in plant pathology, the disease triangle. And the amount of each leg of the triangle is gonna give you the amount of disease. So pathogens of plants, you have fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. Uh, usually, uh, infection from fungi can be seen as specks, spots, and with uh, viruses, often you'll see streaking. There's other types of pathogens. Uh, some call them abiotic pathogens or abiotic stresses. These can be things such as uh, heat, uh, salt intolerances, or soil maladies like black layer. Overwhelmingly, though, diseases of turf grass are caused by fungi. So thinking of the disease triangle, as I mentioned, the amount of disease is dependent on each leg of that triangle. So if you look at the image on the right-hand side of the slide, for example, gray leaf spot uh, is damaging perennial ryegrass in this trial. Uh, and if only 20% of your rough or a home lawn uh, is susceptible perenni perennial ryegrass, and let's say the other 80% is Kentucky bluegrass, which is not a host um, for the pathogen that causes gray leaf spot, then the amount of disease will be much less than if the same rough was com uh, comprised of about 90% of susceptible perennial ryegrass, as you see on the right, where you're gonna get much larger death uh, uh, of the host plants. A couple other uh, small pieces of terminology that are important when discussing um, disease are really knowing the difference between what a sign is and what a symptom is. A sign is the physical structure of the pathogen. So when you see a sign, you're actually seeing the pathogen. Examples of these would be aerial mycelia, uh, a servuli that you see with anthracnose along the base of plants or on the leaf sheaths, uh, and also mushrooms that you see uh, most commonly with fairy ring. Symptoms would be the result of infection, uh, and, and that's a uh, something you see on the plant. Uh, so that would be something like a lesion, um, if you're looking uh, at a turf stand, patches, uh, or chlorosis of, of individual leaves. It's really important to remember, too, from a resistance management st uh, strategy standpoint, that we're controlling the pathogen uh, by inhibiting its growth with fungicides. Um, we do not control the disease. The disease is the visual result of infection. So keep that in mind. It's pathogens that become resistance to fungicides not diseases. Because we're gonna be discussing uh, fungi and, and products that are controlling them, it's important to know the differences between true fungi and fungal-like organisms. True fungi are eukaryotic organisms that lack chlorophyll, which are members of the kingdom fungi and typically reproduced by spores and mycelia. There are two classes of true fungi, uh, and this is based on structures that they form under sexual reproduction. Uh, which really isn't important for this demonstration, but it's important to know that there are two different types of true fungi, ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. Examples of ascomycetes in turf would be the pathogens that cause dollar spot, 
leaf spots, anthracnose, summer patch, necrotic ring spot, take all patch, spring dead spot, and pink snow mold to name a few. Examples of basidiomyces in turf will be a lot of your rise octonia diseases um, and, and others as well, uh, but mainly things like brown patch, yellow patch, whitea patch, red thread, gray snow mold, and fairy ring. It's important to know the differences because there are often chemical classes that target basidiomyces or ascomyces better than some of the other options that you have. There are also fungal-like organisms. They look like fungi, but they are actually not true fungi, and these would be the oomycetes. And the important oomycete uh, in turf would be pythium. So diseases such as pythium root dysfunction, pythium root rot, pythium foliar blight, these are all caused by oomycete pathogens. There are subtle differences uh, from the true fungi. Uh, they lack chitin in their cell walls. They don't form ergosterol. Uh, these are important because uh, certain types of fungicides can be used to target uh, true fungi where they can't be used to target oomycete pathogens. Um, pythium species reproduce sexually, uh, and this uh, often causes them to be uh, a pathogen that develops resistance quickly. Um, also, the mycelia, if you look at them under a microscope, do not have septation or cross walls within them. Perhaps one of the most important oomycetes, uh, while it's not in turf, but just from a, a plant pathology standpoint, would be Phytophthora infestans, or the pathogen that caused the uh, Irish potato famine. Before we get specifically into resistance based on fungicide types, let's remember first that there are two main types of fungicides. The first type of fungicide is a contact fungicide. As the name implies, this stays on the outside of the plant. Examples of contact fungicides would be things like chlorothalonil, fluazinam, and mancozeb. Coverage is critical because they stay on the outside of the plant and they protect the outside of the plant from infection. But if a pathogen is already in the plant, a contact fungicide is not going to help. Chlorothalon and mancozeb have multi-site activity and have low, no, low to no risk for resistance. You can think of these products as hitting different parts of the metabolic pathway and think of them having like a shotgun effect uh, when, they're, when they're trying to take out the pathogen. The second type of fungicides are penetrant fungicides, and as the name implies, these enter the plants. Examples would be your DMIs, your strobilurins, your SDHIs, the dicarboxamides, the polyoxins, and others. Within the penetrant fungicide group, there are three different types of movement with these fungicides. The first is localized. This is where the fungicide is absorbed into the underlying tissue in the general vicinity uh, of where the droplet lands on tissue. There's acropetal penetrants, which move up through the xylem. Uh, examples of these would be tebuconazole and isophenamide. And then there are systemic fungicides, but the only uh, systemic fungicide we have in turf that moves up the xylem and down the phloem uh, would be aluminum tris or fosatil al. Penetrant fungicides have site-specific modes of action. They target one specific spot in the metabolic pathway of the pathogen. And you can think of these uh, fungicides as having a rifle effect. Because of this, Penetrant fungicides are higher at risk for resistance to develop than contact fungicides would be. So fungicide resistance, what is it? Fungicide resistance is the stable, inheritable adaptation of a pathogen to a fungicide. Resistance of a pathogen may be caused by a single gene, this would be a monogenic resistance, or by multiple genes, which is also termed polygenic resistance. There are several mechanisms that cause resistance, and we'll go over these in the next slide, but most commonly, fungicide resistance in turf grass pathogens is caused by target mutations. Factors influencing resistance can be the pathogen type, uh, the pathogen reproduction type, pathogens with polycyclic diseases, or, or polycyclic cycles, I'm sorry, compared to those with monocyclic cycles, or the ones that just have one cycle per year, and repetitive applications from a site-specific mode of action. If you look on the right-hand side of your screen at this example of a fungal cell, uh, you'll see the, the red triangles are the fungicides. So normally what happens is a fungicide enters the fungal cell and finds the target protein uh, within the fungus. As long as no resistance or mutations have occurred, that fungicide will bind to the target protein 
and it will not allow the fungus uh, to continue uh, to proliferate. However, what happens after repeated use of site-specific modes of action is that these target sites overwhelmingly are altered, which you can see by number one in the diagram. Essentially, the fungus mutates that target site and the fungicide no longer binds. There are other mechanisms by which uh, resistance occurs. Uh, that can be an overexpression of target sites by the fungal cell. You can also have efflux pumps, which actually recognize the fungicide and pump it out of the cell. Uh, and there's also detoxification or metabolism, which uh, basically the fungal cell metabolizes the, the active ingredient and, and, and renders it useless. Most commonly though, as I mentioned, uh, it's gonna be that number one, the mutated target site, which causes resistance in, in fungi. Looking at a lot of the groups that we use in turf, uh, I just wanna point out the mechanism of resistance um, that have been documented for different groups. So your benzimidazoles, that would be an example, would be like thiophanate methyl, uh, an altered target site of the beta tubulin gene. Your phenylamides, this would be methanoxum. This is altered target site with RNA polymerase. Uh, the dicarboxamides, uh, they have an altered target site. The DMIs, they actually have a number of different types of resistance uh, mechanisms. And that's why with DMIs, you tend to see a gradient uh, of, of whether or not uh, a particular class is working. Uh, it might work uh, well with some active ingredients. You might have uh, insensitivity with others, but we'll get more into that type of resistance, which we call quantitative resistance here shortly. Uh, lastly, the strobilurins, the, that's an alter, altered target site within cytochrome C reductase. So because we know this, it's important to know uh, which pathogens are going to be high at risk for developing resistance to fungicides. I have here listed the five uh, pathogens that are most at risk for resistance to develop. That would be Claridia species, the dollar spot pathogens, uh, Microdochium nivale, the pathogen that causes pink snow mold, Pythium afani dermatum, which causes Pythium blight, Magnapore theorizae, which is gray leaf spot, and Colotoxicum cereale, which causes anthracnose. I will note with Pythium species that with your Pythium diseases, the only Pythium species that has documented resistance in Terpras is Pythium afanidermatum, Pythium afanidermatum, which causes Pythium blight. Now, looking at documented cases of fungicide resistance, the first would be with Claridia or dollar spot. This is where we see a lot of issues uh, with resistance uh, with even newer classes of chemistry, such as the SDHIs. Uh, the DMIs have documented resistance as do the benzimidazoles, the thiophenate methyl, and, and also the dicarboxamides. An example there would be iprodione. With Microdochium nivale, the pathogen that causes pink snow mold, the only documented class that has resistance would be the dicarboxamides. Uh, with Pythium blight, or Pythium afani dermatum, uh, the groups that have been compromised at this time would be the phenylamides. Uh, and the QOI fungicides or the strobilurin fungicides. With Magnapore theorizae, uh, which causes gray leaf spot, the QOIs have documented uh, resistance issues with this pathogen. And lastly, with the anthracnose pathogen, Colotoxicum cereale, uh, the classes that have demonstrated uh, resistance are the DMIs, the strobilurins or the QOIs, as well as the benzimidazoles. So the fungicide groups most at risk, we went from looking at the pathogens that are most at risk, now let's look at the fungicide groups that are most at risk for resistance to develop. The benzimidazoles, uh, the dicarboxamides, the phenylamides, the SDHIs, and the QOIs are the groups that are listed at uh, most at risk for uh, having resistance developed to them by pathogens. And this is put together by the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, or FRAC. There is an excellent diagram that was uh, put together by uh, Rick Latin uh, in his book, uh, uh, Superintendent's Guide to Turfgrass Fungicides. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen and you can see uh, there are uh, it's it's basically looking at the combined risk factors for fungicide resistance uh, and what it does is it looks at the, the diseases or actually it should be the pathogens that cause those diseases and it gives it a biological risk uh, as to whether or not resistance is likely to develop then along the bottom you can see the fungicides going from left to right it goes from low risk to high risk based on the chemical classes and if you look at those chemical classes 
let's say in with the highest risk, uh, a, a risk factor of three, those are the ones I just mentioned, the dicarboxamides, the DMIs, phenylamides, the QOIs, and, and uh, the benzimidazoles. And then you look at the pathogen risk, which is highest on the top left. Again, those pathogens I listed, uh, Claridia, Microdochium nivale, uh, Pythimophani dermatum, Magnaporthiorizae. You can see that when you make an application of those uh, fungicide groups that are most at risk for having resistance develop, uh, you can see that if you make those applications on the pathogens that are most at risk, you get a combined score of 12. Whereas if you were to apply uh, a fungicide such as fluazinam, which has a low risk of one, uh, and apply that for a disease uh, such as, let's say, brown patch, uh, you have a biological risk of two, your overall combined risk uh, for having resistance to develop would only be a two. So it's important to keep this in mind. It's a very handy guide uh, that Dr. Latin put together uh, in, in that book, um, A Practical Guide to Turfgrass Fungicides, um, which you can be found through APS um, journals, uh, where you can, you can see how um, the use of a particular class on a particular pathogen uh, may lead to the potential for increased resistance later on down the road. So what does resistance look like um, basically from a, a graphical representation, right? Well, there's two types of resistance. As I mentioned, there's monogenic and polygenic. And uh, qualitative resistance would be monogenic. And this is what we think of as something of having an all or none type, right? It's a quality. It either occurs or it doesn't. Examples of qualitative resistance, meaning the, the fungicides will either work or they won't work, uh, would be the benzimidazoles, the QOIs, and the phenylamides. So if you look on the top hand uh, portion of this schematic uh, listed A, at the beginning, you're going to have all sensitive uh, individuals, meaning when the fungicide is applied, they're all going to be sensitive, they'll all be killed off. As you go on and there is repeated selection, meaning you're applying the fungicide, you're applying the fungicide, you're applying the fungicide, same mode of action, site specific, and you're not rotating, eventually, as with all biological organisms, mutation is going to occur. And once you have uh, a mutant, uh, which in our case is gonna be one that has an altered target site in most cases, that is eventually over time going to take over uh, the population and you'll be selecting for a population that is resistant to that particular class, which is gonna render it useless in your fungicide program. Quantitative resistance, on the other hand, which is uh, schematic B uh, on the right-hand side, is going to have varying degrees of resistance, and some like to refer to this as insensitivity. Examples of this would be your SDHIs, your DMIs, and the dicarboxamides. You might find that certain chemicals within each of those classes work very well, while others don't work well at all. You can see that by the different uh, uh, types uh, of, of gradient colors that you see within um, the right or the bottom part of your screen there, where some um, that are, are, are gray are only slightly resistant, where the ones that are black are completely resistant, uh, and the ones that are, are, are just uh, the white circles are the sensitive population. And what you end up with over time after repeated sprays from those particular types of fungicides is you have uh, certain uh, populations uh, that are have completely resistant, some that are even intermediately resistant, and some that are still sensitive. And you're always going to control the sensitive uh, uh, part of the population. What you're not going to control is the resistant part of the population. But the importance of resistance management is ideally we use all the different fungicide classes we have so that we don't get to the point where we're selecting uh, for a, a population that is resistant to a particular fungicide class um, or even groups of fungicides. So now looking at that on paper is a little bit different than seeing what it looks like in real life. And I have to give credit to uh, Dr. Gunwa Jung of the University of Massachusetts for uh, the photo on the left-hand side of your screen. Essentially, these are aerial shots. Um, you'll see a, a couple different things. There's SDHC, uh, G91R, that's a specific type of mutation within the SDHI fungicides. There's SDHB, H267Y, that's another type of mutation. Uh, same thing with the bottom right with the G150R. But I first want to draw your attention to the, the box that says sensitive. If you look there, uh, there are, are several different colored boxes, all of which you find the same uh, in each of those uh, white squares. The black represents the, uh, the black box there represents the, the sensitive population. Okay, so that's a non-treated control. 
The yellow box represents boscolin. The uh, blue box represents fluxopyroxad. The white box represents isophetamid, and the red box represents um, fluopyrin. So if you look at each of these, in the sensitive population, the only place where you see dollar spot occurring is in that black box, which is the, the non-treated control or, or the sensitive population. As you look across the G91R at the top left-hand uh, uh, portion of that photo, you can see going across boscolid and fluxopyroxad really are not providing much control at all, whereas isophetamine looks to be providing very good control, and fluopyrin is somewhat in the middle. If you go over to the H267Y mutation, you can see that boscolid really isn't providing any control compared to the non-treated. But going across with the other SDHIs, you're good. If you go down to the bottom right, the G150R, you can see that essentially none of those SDHIs uh, are providing control of this resistant population. Um, so that's where I was talking about with the, the quantitative type resistance that you see with the, the SDHIs. It really depends on what active ingredient you're using and what the mutant population is as to whether or not you're going to control it. On the right-hand side of your screen, this is just an in vitro plate assay uh, with different concentrations of fungicides going from 0.01 parts per million to 100 parts per million, just to give you an idea of what these two different resistance types look like. So on the top where it says A, uh, you can see that while there is a little bit of a reduction in growth um, of, the, uh, of the fungus, really that above field level application rate at 100 parts per million is not controlling this pathogen. That would be an example of qualitative resistance. It's a quality. It's occurring. It's either there or it's not. For B, on the bottom part of your screen, you can see that there is essentially no growth uh, at 10 and 100 parts per million. Uh, but as you go back to the control, there is growth of the fungus. So over different uh, uh, concentrations of the fungicide, there is different types of growth. And this would be an example of, of what you're looking at when you see insensitivity with quantitative resistance. One last look at the, uh, the example I showed above. This is just another photo. Uh, this is more close up of plots, looking at dollar spot with two different resistant populations. So in each row with resistant population one, you see the non-treated check, which is obliterated by dollar spot, as is this SDHI fungicide. If you look at resistance populate, resistant population number two, you can see again, the non-treated is obliterated, but there's much less dollar spot um, occurring uh, in these plots. Now, these plots were inoculated very heavily, so you're going to get breakthrough on almost every scenario to some degree, but you can see the difference between the different types of mutations as to whether or not a fungicide is not going to work almost at all, or if it's going to provide some benefit. And if you're properly tank mixing and rotating, a lot of times you're going to be able to control these populations, even if there is some level of insensitivity. So how to effectively manage fungicide resistance? you got to be familiar with the different fungicide groups and what diseases or pathogens they effectively control. Rotate your modes of action. You should not be applying a site-specific mode of action more than two consecutive applications. Tank mix active ingredients with different MOAs, particularly, or modes of action, particularly using multi-site fungicides whenever you can. It's very important, and, and I get this a lot, rotating modes of action does not mean spraying different active ingredients from the same class. It means spraying active ingredients with different modes of action. Likewise, it doesn't mean spraying different premix products when you've sprayed a product from the same class prior to that, that's the standalone product. So you can apply an SDHI by itself, an SDHI is part of a premix, and then another SDHI fungicide. That is not properly rotating um, act, uh, modes of action. Encourage turf grass growth with fertility and BMPs. Uh, Dr. Clark out of Rutgers has done a lot of work uh, looking at the fertility management aspects and best management uh, practices um, pertaining to uh, anthractose control, as has the rest of the Northeast uh, research group or research project, I should say. Um, so Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, if you go to frac.info, you can uh, log in and you can find uh, a great, great resource for turf grass managers, and that's to... Uh, Look at the different frac groups, right? So if you're looking at frac group four here, it tells you that it's a phenylamide fungicide, what it's targeting, uh, and the active ingredients from that group. Likewise, you can see on the right-hand side there, frac group 11, it has high risk. That's going to be your strobilurins, and it tells you where it's targeting.
Another great reference is put together by the University of Kentucky uh, and more recently was uh, added to with Rutgers and, and University of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Clark, Dr. Vincelli, and Dr. Koch have all put this together. Essentially, for each of these, uh, it gives a nice bio on the pathogen that causes the disease, and then it lists the different standalone products with FRAC codes and their efficacy, um, as well as combination products, the FRAC codes they represent, and their efficacy uh, from university research trials. Developing a program based on resistance management. So first, make a list of what diseases at your facility and when they occur. Is it a fall, spring, or summer issue, right? Know what active ingredients or products are cornerstones for controlling the most problematic or hard to control diseases. Find out what you need in order to control those, and then you can place the rest of the pieces of the puzzle around it. Also, know what pathogens and diseases are most at risk for development of resistance. Once you have a foundation for the products for the tough control diseases, surround them with the next, next best option, but try to make it a different MOA if possible. Rotating MOAs does not mean spraying different active ingredients from the same class as I just mentioned. It means spraying different MOAs. Make sure you don't have two consecutive applications from site-specific modes of action. And remember that promoting resistance management will re result in achieving optimum disease control because different fungicide groups will remain efficacious against pathogens that are high at risk for developing resistance for a longer period of time, basically getting keeping more tools in the tool shed. And remember, your go-to products for disease control are only as good as what you surround them with. Briefly, I'm going to talk about a few different fungicides from PBI Gordon to help promote resistance management. Pedigree fungicide, this is flutalanil. Uh, it's, an, it's an SDHI fungicide. It's long been the gold standard for control of fairy ring uh, in turf grass. Uh, Pedigree is an SC formulation uh, of flutalanil, easier to use. Um, applications for uh, control of your basidiomycete fungi, uh, particularly fairy ring, should start when soil temps at the two inch depth are 55 degrees for three to five consecutive days. Uh, and the nice part about applying for uh, fairy ring with two applications, 21 to 28 days apart, uh, at that 3.25 fluid ounce rate, is that you're also gonna get control of a lot of the other basidiomycetes that pop up early springtime. So yellow patch uh, and wikia patch being examples of those, as well as brown patch. Here is uh, an image of two applications uh, of uh, pedigree applied with a wetting agent, uh, both applications, 28 days apart. Uh, you can see these are two different angles at the same plot, but you can see there's fairy ring all around these plots. Great control of fairy ring preventively with pedigree fungicide. Here is uh, an image of large patch on the left-hand side of your screen. We've really seen very strong control of uh, large patch with two spring applications of pedigree at 3.25 fluid ounces. Again, the nice part here, because of that acropetal movement of this fungicide, you make an application preventively for fairy ring, it's gonna move up the plant uh, and you'll get control of large patch as well. Segway fungicide, this should be a staple in everyone's fungicide program for controlling your different pythium species, whether it be pythium blight, pythium root rot, particularly in the transition zone, a lot of folks go to Segway for control of pythium root rot. There's no known resistance to this mode of action, the QOIs, let's keep it that way. Uh, it's got a rate range of 0.45 to 0.9 fluid ounces. Uh, here is an example. This is at the University of Tennessee back in 2016, uh, Dr. Horvath's program. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, this is uh, an application of Segway versus a non-treated control on your right uh, and other treatments around it that weren't working very well. There were no pigments included uh, or fertilizers or anything. In this. This, is just, this is how good Segway controls uh, the pathogen that causes pythium root rot. This is a uh, pythium foliar blight. This is at Penn State University in 2016. You can see again, Segway providing outstanding control of pythium blight compared to the non-treated control. Uh, again, uh, the Segway uh, or Cyazafam, the active ingredient is from a, uh, uh, the only active ingredient from the QII or quinone inside inhibitor uh, fungicide class, which is very similar to the QOIs or the strobilurins, um, but it's the only active ingredient from that class, FRAC group 21. Uh, and while it's important to utilize this, this active ingredient and this product in your program, uh, it's also very important to rotate properly with other modes of action. The newest product out from PBI Gordon for resistance management 
uh, would be combining Segway or Cyzofamid with a strobilurin or a Zoxystrobin in this case. Uh, so you have FRAC groups 21 and 11. Uh, and the nice part is, is that FRAC has done work or the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, I should say, has done work to show that there's no known cross resistance between these two modes of action. So you're getting a dual mode of action product uh, for Pythium pathogens. It's an SC formulation with rates from 2.9 to 5.75 fluid ounces per thousand. From work we've done uh, with a variety of cooperators, whether it's uh, Dr. Clark in the Northeast uh, or um, uh, Dr. Uh, John Aguagiato, uh, Dr. Horvath at Tennessee, Dr. Jim Kearns at NC State, we've seen the same story over and over. And that's a lot of times that the lower rate um, tends to look better uh, when applied on a 14-day interval. So keep it short on a 14-day interval. Uh, and uh, you don't need to really, I mean, if you want to try to go longer, that's great. But I, with being more of a greens product, we've just seen better control. Uh, or even for fairways with Pythium blight, we've seen at Rutgers University, a lot of times you just get the best control when you go on the shorter interval with a 14-day application. Key diseases, uh, it's also a really nice product for your uh, Bermuda grass greens, particularly if you're worrying about Pythium blight, whether or not it's Pythium blight or leaf spot. The Azoxystrobin is going to help control that leaf spot. Um, if you're watering this product in, the Azoxystrobin is going to be a great summer patch uh, or great part of your summer patch program. Uh, also, that in, uh, the, the uh, Azoxystrobin is going to be nice um, for a fairy ring uh, preventative application. I like to think, hey, if you go out early with pedigree uh, application for control of fairy ring, typically within 21 to 28 days, you're going to be getting soil temps up to that 65 degree Fahrenheit range or around there at the two inch depth. And that's going to be a great time to apply union as both a follow up to pedigree as part of a resistance management program, but also as a nice application for preventive uh, pythium root rot control. And the nice part about that is you have two modes of action uh, working on that as, as the QOIs are very strong against controlling. Pythium root rot as well. Here's a few quick photos for you. Uh, this is at Rutgers University. On the left, you have uh, Union applied at 2.9 fluid ounces on a 14-day interval. And on the right, this is Pythium blight. Uh, that's a non-treated check. So you can see Pythium uh, or Union, I'm sorry, on the, the low rate, shorter interval uh, looks fantastic. This is at NC State University. On the right, you see uh, an area uh, that's a non-treated control. This is about 14 days after the trial was initiated. There was disease present at the time this trial was initiated. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see union at 2.9 fluid ounces. This is after one application. Those are the curative properties we've observed with union. And you can see outside of the red box on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that there is disease around those areas too. So that's just one application of union um, curatively controlling root rot. This is a slide from NC State University. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. You can copy that. They have a whole article on uh, controlling Pythium species. But this is just an example to show you some data of uh, curative control of Pythium root rot on a creeping bent grass green. Um, two applications, and you can see how well uh, that higher rate of union, and really just all rates of Segway and union did compared to the non-treated control um, in controlling root rot uh, curatively. Tekin fungicide, this is an SDHI fungicide, isofenamid with tebuconazole, which is a DMI. Uh, it's fantastic for broad spectrum control of both ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. Uh, dollar spot, brown patch, and anthracnose on extended intervals. I would recommend 21 days for all these products. Brown patch, you can take out easily to 28 days. I actually think the hidden gem uh, of Tekin is its summer patch control. It's been one of the top performers year after year since we've been testing it for controlling summer patch, typically two to three applications, 28 days apart, watered in, are gonna provide optimal control uh, of summer patch preventively. Uh, excellent control of Waitia patch and fairy ring have also been observed with this product. Uh, it has a single use rate, which is nice of three fluid ounces. You're limited to three applications per year, and it is for golf course turf uh, use only. Here's an example of dollar spot control on 21 and 28 day intervals at the University of Connecticut. On the left, you have your non-treated check. In the center is the 21 day rate of Tekin at three fluid ounces. And on the right is the 28 day interval uh, at three fluid ounces of Tekin controlling dollar spot uh, preventively. Lastly, uh, the product I'm gonna talk about is Kabuto. Kabuto is our SDHI fungicide. Um, it's for use 
for controlling dollar spot and spring dead spot. While it may not be unique from a fungicide resistance management standpoint um, for controlling dollar spot, because it is an SDHI and the SDHIs have got a lot of overuse with dollar spot control, it is nice because it is uh, a, one of the newer active ingredients out for spring dead spot. Um, it is a fantastic product for spring dead spot, and I would argue one of the best on the market. Uh, here's an example, uh, just a quick photo uh, of, a, of a demo we did at uh, a golf course in Salisbury, Maryland on the left, non-treated area on the right. You can see complete control of spring dead spot, not even any of that superficial blemish you sometimes get with some of the other active ingredients out there. But if you are going to go for spring dead spot, I would recommend two applications. First application should be made when soil temps at the two inch depth are 70 degrees Fahrenheit for three to five days. And you should go at rates over one fluid ounce per thousand square feet per application. So summary, resistance uh, of pathogens and diseases, people like to say, to fungicides that's actively occurring and it's evolving, right? Mutation is a biological function that continues to occur all the time. Resistance is a stable, inheritable adaptation of a pesticide, um, uh, of a, or I'm sorry, of a pest to a pesticide, or in our case, from a fungus to a fungicide, um, typically due to target mutations. Resistance can be monogenic or polygenic, so qualitative or quantitative. Major pathogens of cool season turf uh, are resistant to one or more fungicide groups, um, and those pathogens that are resistant to more than one group would be the anthracnose pathogen, the dollar spot pathogen, the pithy blight pathogen, uh, and gray leaf spot pathogens. It's imperative uh, to alternate MOAs or modes of action and use BMPs to control uh, and cultural practices to control pathogens as best you can to reduce the risk for resistance developing by overusing particular or, or specific modes of action. Incorporating multi-site fungicides wherever possible into uh, tank mixes is a great resistance management tool. And new technology and combination products afford turf grass managers with the ability to combat resistance, but make sure if you're using pre-mixed products, you know what you're using on either side of that to make sure you don't have more than two consecutive applications of a site-specific mode of action. Even if that's a tank mix with a, with a multi-site product, you can't have more than two consecutive apps uh, with a site-specific mode of action. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit more about fungicide resistance, uh, how it happens, how it works, and the ways to combat it. Uh, PBI Gordon has arranged for external education points uh, for this event. Please use code 999-236-13-31254 on the GCHAA website with the date you have watched. Again, that number is 999-236-13-31254. Three one two five four, and again, please put that code in on the GCSA website when the date you have watched. Appreciate you listening, and look forward to seeing you sometime soon.